This work is done at Baidu. So uh, my talk is generally is about uh, building a multi-domain spoken dialogue system, and this is the topics I will cover during my talk. So I'll discuss about the domain selection problem and the system <coughs> accessibility and the policy optimization algorithm we use to solve those problems. So before going into the details, I, I'll show you a video to generally show how this thing works. 明天去上海的飞机票 上海明天有雨吗？上海明天终于转小雨，雨天请防护。坐火车呢？ 白云机场今天涨了吗? 白云机场涨了百分之零点四二。百度呢？您要继续股票查询吗？可以输入是的，不是。是的。百度价格是二百点一二元，涨幅加百分之零点八五。Alright, that's it. So, uh, I guess most of you. More or less has some experience with Apple Siri. So this is a, just a voice assistant app very similar to Siri. So now let's look into the technical details. So this is the overall architecture of the system. Of course, it's simplified illustration. So <clears throat> what we got? Firstly, we have several individual spoken dialogue systems, each <coughs> sorry, <coughs> excuse me, each designed for a particular domain. And uh, we call them domain experts. And by dialogue system, we mean this system has the ability to do multi-turn dialogues, to do a you know turn by turn you know question answering to satisfy a user's query. And some of the domain experts can have subdomains. For example, the travel information domain has the flight booking, uh, train ticket booking, and hotel booking subdomains. And whether we put it as a subdomain or should it be a you know individual domain experts depend on whether we want the sub-components to share information. And besides those domain experts, we, we have something which in general call them out-of-domain services. So those out-of-domain services are not dialogues. So basically, this, this is a single turn thing. So you give a query, and it directly returns you an answer. There's no dialogue involved. OK. so. <coughs> Then we have a central controller. So what it does is when the user's speech input is recognized by ASR, then there's a user intention classifier, which initially gives a label of that query to say which domain it belongs to. And there's a confidence score associated with it as well. Then the query, the label, and the confidence score together are passed to the central controller. Firstly, the central controller distributes this information to all the domain experts and out of domain services. And all these components will return their results to the central controller. For, the, for domain experts, they will also return a confidence score to say how likely this query belongs to my domain considering the current context I have. Okay, but for out of domain services, we, do, we did some engineering work here. So basically, we don't let the central controller directly deal with their outputs. There's a service priority ranker. So all the, they, they rank the priority of the services by considering their data source quality, the number of results they return, and various other factors they have. And they just return one best result. It seems, you know, it, it's, it's fit the, fits the user's query you know, best to the central controller. Basically, then what the central controller does is, okay, it can do two types of things. Firstly, it can decide whose results should I give to the user, so it's a domain selection problem. Okay, but if it's not confident enough, or there's ambiguities, 
The central controller can also do a confirmation or clarification action. So by confirmation, we mean to confirm whether a user wants to continue the dialogue in a particular domain or switch to out of domain services. <clears throat> and by clarification, we mean clarifying between two domains. So basically, <laughs> the domain selection problem is, uh, you can think it uh, looks like a classification problem, but because you have this confirmation and the clarification action here, the whole problem is actually a planning problem. Because for this confirmation and the clarification, there's no you know, right or wrong answer. There's no gold standard to say when and where you should confirm. Basically, you need to look into the future decisions to, to see whether you, this is a good decision here. All right. And more importantly, you can imagine such a system is built gradually you know, for a long time, and you may have more and more domain experts built in the future. You don't want to you know, retrain your central controller every time when a domain expert is integrated into your system, right? So the system accessibility is a strong requirement here. <coughs> All right, so how can we solve the central controlling problem? Since it's a planning problem, we can use some established planning algorithm to, to, to do it. For example, the mark decision process, which is a very widely used model for long-term planning. And what it does is, so every time the system is at a particular state and it do an action here, and receive a reward, and it, it transits to another state, and the goal of it is to maximize the <coughs> reward, you, you know, the long-term reward you receive, okay. So in standard definition, how can we formulate our problem into the MDP framework? So you can imagine for system state, in our case, it will be, you know, all the states of the, you know, all the domain experts and the out-of-domain services, all right. <coughs> And for action, so what actions can we define here? So basically, we have four types of actions. Firstly, present means we present a domain expert's results to the user. Or present OOD means we, we give the you know, results from the out-of-domain services to the user. And confirm means we can confirm <coughs> whether the user wants to continue the dialogue within a particular domain or you know, if, if the user says no, then it will switch to out of domain services. And clarify is clarify between two domains. So you can see there are four types of actions and each action can take a domain, one or two domain, as its operand. Okay, so you can imagine our state space is very huge. We don't want to deal with the discrete states because it's just intractable. So what, what we can do is, we can do a function of approximation. We visualize our states and action pairs. And we use this, you know, there's a model parameter sheet. We use the inner products of this visual vector and the width vector to approximate the Q value. The Q value is the, basically is the quantity of the long-term expected reward we're gonna get by executing an action at a particular state. And in our case, our action has an action type and uh, one or two operand, which is the domain. But you can see, up to now, the problem is not domain extensible because the action and the state both de depend on how many domain experts you have, okay? So how can we make it domain independent? So we play some trick here. Firstly, we define a visualization for each action type, like this. And we assume this fish function only takes the domain in focus as its input. So we ignore the you know, information of all the other domain experts that is not the operand of this action. Okay. <clears throat> and then we, we do a per perimeter tying trick. So we force the feature vectors that corresponds to a same action type to share a same weight vector. And after this, you can see that this whole function is independent of the number of domains you got, right? You, you, it only depends on the action types and uh, every time you have a new domain or you, whatever you have a domain expert, you can just substitute it, substitute it into the function to get this value. 
Right, to do the visualization, we want it to be generalizable to all domain experts. So we can't use any domain specific features. We have to use high level features. Okay, so we use some summary features to describe the dialogue state. You know, like how many slots it's filled for that in that domain, okay. And the confidence scores by the, you know, intention classifier and the domain experts, which is very important information as well. And some summary information about the dialogue history, like, you know, the last turn of a particular domain being activated and the last turn of the last time of a particular domain being, you know, confirmed and, you know, total number of turns that the domain has been activated, something like that. And not all the features are used for, you know, all the action types. This is, you know, how do we select a feature for each action type, right? Now we can do the policy optimization. But before that, we need to solve some practical problems. Firstly, I mean, traditionally, dialogue systems and the policy for dialogue systems are trained using user simulations. So you have a simulator simulating the user behaviors. Then you can easily collect a lot of data to train your policy, your reinforcement re learning algorithm, typically. But in our case, you can imagine that this, this system is it's almost open domain. So there are just infinitely many possible situations. You, you just can't enumerate them all. So it's just impractical to do a user simulation in, in this <coughs> problem. OK, how about we collect a lot of data and uh, you know, manually labeling them afterward? It's still less helpful. Because you have this, you know, uh, confirmation, clarification actions, and it's a planning problem. There's no gold standard to say, you know, whether this is a good action or not. It's basically pretty much depend on how you feel the dialogue, the natural needs of the dialogue. So what we have to do is to do a reinforcement learning by directly interacting with human users. Okay, you, in order to do that, there's two basic requirements for the reinforcement learning algorithm we need. So firstly, it must be simple efficient because human interaction is expensive to collect. Okay? And secondly, we need a batch learning algorithm. Why is that? It's a bit tricky. So because we use function approximation, when you use a function approximation for reinforcement learning, what will happen is your, your, there's no guarantee for your learning curve to convert to a certain point. So usually what happens is your, the quality of your policy, you know, grows up to a certain point and then it shakes like that, you know. But if you have a user simulator, you can evaluate the policy at every point and decide which is the best policy you got up to now and it just keep that policy. But since we don't have such user simulator, if we use a totally online learning algorithm, there's no way we can know when we should, we should stop or, you know, which policy we should keep. But to use batch learning, <coughs> what we can do is, every time we collect a new batch of data, at the same time, it's an evaluation for the policy you've got so far. So you can draw the learning curve and decide which policy you want. All right. So considering those two requirements, Gaussian precise temporal difference is a good algorithm. So the basic idea of Gaussian precise temporal difference is you put a Gaussian precise prior for your QLU, and you put a Gaussian noise prior for your ratio, and give a lot of data, you can infer your posterior, which is another Gaussian with the mean defined in this form and the covariance in this form. So I won't go into the mathematical details. It's pretty much a standard Gaussian precise thing. But we played the parameter tying trick. Correspondingly, what happened to the kernel function is only the two points that corresponds to a same action type will have an actual kernel value, the others, you know, will, will be zero. All right. And the, during the training, we also want some exploration and exploitation trade-off. So we do a epsilon greedy method. So with probability, probability one minus epsilon, we're going to select the action corresponds to the maximum mean, which is the action we think is best. And with probability epsilon, we're going to choose the action corresponds to the maximum covariance which means the action we are most uncertain about. So there's the, you know, give the algorithm some ability to explore. Right, then the, how do we set up the experiment? So we have 15 users. 
And we ask them to contribute file dialogs per day. And since not every user can every day experiment, we got basically 50 to 70 dialogs per day. And we lasted it for five days. We iterate our policy learning algorithm every day. So it's policy iteration <coughs> way. So, and after each dialog, we ask the user to score the dialog according to a score, scoring standard from one to five, like that. And that's the learning curve we got. So there are two views. The first view is the average score with standard deviation. And the second view is the domain selection accuracy based on the post annotation. And both will agree that the policy we got at this point is the best policy we got so far. So we just keep it for the future experiments. Then we do a prior comparison. So we compare the system with this trained policy with a baseline system, which is rule-based. And the rule-based system is actually the publicly deployed version of this voice assistant mobile app. So there's, you can imagine this very carefully designed rules for the mass selection. And also during training, we only use two domain experts. And we keep one domain expert unseen to the learning algorithm. And we reserve it for domain extension test. Okay, then there's four evaluation scenarios. So the first scenario is to evaluate the performance of the two systems on switching between the domain expert and auto domain services. And the second scenario is the performance on switching between two domain experts. Also, you can go to auto domain services, but it's not required. It's not necessary. Okay. And this is based on the you know the two domains that you have seen in the training. And the third scenario is similar to the first one, except that we use the new domain. We ask the user to test the new domain, which is unseen to the learning algorithm. And the fourth one is similar to the second one, except that we have a new domain integrated, and the user must power this new domain. Okay. And that's the result we got. So firstly, for the first and the third scenario, the difference between the two, the two systems are statistically insignificant. You can see the p-value is too high. But for the second and the fourth scenario, the system with the trained policy performs significantly better than, you know, than the baseline system. Okay, that's the, seems the problem is solved, preliminarily. We still have some open questions to discuss, okay? But firstly, it's uh, the engineering issue because currently we let the central controller to do the <clears throat> to do the realization for the confirmation and the clarification actions. But that's not uh, you know, sufficient because the central controller don't know any context about their dialogue. So sometimes the, the utterance is general, it's, it's not very natural. So we think the better way of doing that is to ask the central controller to send a signal to you know particular domain expert and let the surface realization, the NRG part, done in this domain expert because the domain expert has the full context, so it can do you know more natural NRG utterance. Okay, and most <coughs> sorry, more importantly, how about scaling up of a our experiment is very difficult. We only have a limited number of users, and, uh, you know, so it's still preliminary at this stage. And the, the, the users we have basically is the RD team. So possibly this mismatch between our users, the, you know, they are not really real users. We may think differently as real users. But can we learn you know, directly from real users? That's an open question because to do that, you need to automatically infer the user satisfaction. So there's no explicit reward you can see. So how, to, how, how can we do that? It's uh, just some question we can discuss. All right, thanks for your attention. Okay. Is there any question? Um, I think the um, um, 
estimating rewards for uh, dialogue policy optimization. I, I see this more as an academic challenge than a practical issue. Uh, in most of the uh, deployed systems, mm -hmm. the interaction never goes be beyond two or three turns. Do you really need uh, to compute rewards you know, as if the conversation is going to last 10 turns? A simple classification methods uh, would go a long way. The thing is, uh, all right, so the, firstly, we use the planning definition instead of classification because, I'm, I mean, it's, a, it's basically just for those clarification and the confirmation actions, right? But, but uh, still, it's, uh, you can't say whether you, sh you know, you can't say it's definitely true you're gonna, you know, clarify at this point or you, you're gonna, you know, you, you definitely need to confirm at this point. It's not that, you know, true-false answer to it. Basically, it's still, uh, you know, maybe it's not my very long-term planning, but still you need to look into the future for a few steps to decide whether this is a good decision for clarification or confirmation. So that's why it's a, it's a, a planning problem. And also for the dialogues, it means only, you know, three or two or three turns. Yes, that's true, that's uh, very true. But that's uh, also, I mean, that's, uh, I think that depends on what way you think about it. So in academic, in spoken dialogue system, we do have, you know, dialogues for 10 turns or even more, but does real users, you know, are they patient enough to do such dialogues if you de deploy a system like that, right? So that's basically, that's, that's the real world, you know? <laughs> so it's uh, just uh, different from academic. I'm from academic, but, Still, it's uh, the real world problem is quite diff different. That's that's my understanding, <laughs> my opinion. Uh, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Um, you seem to have handled. Uh, not having to know ahead of time how many domain experts. Uh, Mm -hmm. in this interesting way. But uh, one question I had is that an important input mm -hmm. is the confidence from each domain expert. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, can you say a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. how the confidence might change when you add, for one domain expert might change when you add in different domain experts? Uh, no, they, I would say they will change. Basically each domain expert will generate uh, the confidence according to its own context. So there are two different types of confidence scores. I can t tell you more de details about it, okay. So there are two types of confidence scores. The first one is generated by the user intention and classifier. And that thing for, you know, for domain expert, those confidence scores are not very reliable because the user intention classifier has no context about dialog. It's basically give a query and just give you a confidence score to say possibly which domain it belongs to. Imagine this situation if you are booking a flight ticket and you're saying I'm flying to Beijing, but you just say if the system asks where are you flying to, you just say Beijing, then the user intention classifier has no context at all. You just seeing Beijing, it can be anything, you know. So the confidence score from that part is less accurate. But each domain expert has the full context about the dialogue, right? And all of them will, when, when the central controller distributes this Beijing query into all, every of these domain experts, and each of them will reevaluate this according to the context they got so far and return another confidence score to the central controller. This, this is the second type of confidence score. And the confidence score has some, you know, it's basically, unif I mean, how, Basically, it's in the same range, so they won't change. You have a new domain expert, it will, you know, give you another confidence score to say whether this is my domain. For example, movie search, if you get, give Beijing to it, it probably give you a low confidence score, so it's not belong to my domain. So it's working, you know, in that way. Does it answer your question? Sorry. You can take it offline, okay. So let's yeah. thank, again, our speaker. Oh. <laughs>